staff as a McDonald's, and there was a guy named Brown who uh, was also on there, supposedly a white-haired fellow that came out, and supposedly he was a former satanic priest. Do you remember that? I don't remember that. Okay, it's been a lot of years. Anyhow, well, we, we stopped at McDonald's before we went over there. Do you remember that? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I remember all my words. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. We're going to ask Fred if there's anything he can't remember. Okay. And he, he'd tell us, but he forgot. <laughs> anyhow, anyhow, I, I said that to say this. When we were in there, we were sitting there at the table, and all of a sudden, that happened to me. The hair on my arms stood way up. And I, I know that happens also if you're out there uh, in a field someplace or up on a high place, and lightning's about to strike. That will happen. You're, you know, and and I'm, I'm looking at that, and all of a sudden I look up, and here comes this guy who supposedly came out of Satanism. He had white hair, and as he was walking towards me, he, he looked at me just for a second. And when he did, he, he, he broke away real fast. And when he walked by, just I could feel there was this guy just had a real evil presence about him. Well, I didn't think nothing of it, and then later we did the radio program, and all the pastors gathered for prayer. And he came in, and they called him, and said, we're praying. He couldn't pray with us. He was supposedly came out of Satanism. He, he could not pray with us. He, he, he started to, and then you know, he, had, he, he had to leave. He just couldn't stay in the same room. And so that's why I can, I can see when he said, And the Spirit passed before my face, and the hair of my flesh stood up. It stood still, but I could not discern the form thereof. An image was before mine eyes. There was silence. And I heard a voice saying, Now here we go with the doubt, you see. Now he's, he's going to be placing doubt. Now all along, old Eliphaz thought he was hearing from an angel of God. Shall mortal man be more than more just than God? Shall a man be more pure than his maker? Behold, he put no trust in his servants, and his angels he charged with folly. In other words, he's saying, you see what he did with his angels? His angels? He didn't put any trust in them. See how he treated them? How much less in them that dwell in houses of clay, whose foundation is the dust, which are crushed before thy mom? In other words, he's saying, how much less should he put with you, you puny human beings, made out of the dust of the ground? You think God cares about you? Look what he did to the angels. They are destroyed from morning to evening. They perish forever without any regarding it. Does not their excellency, which is in them, go away? They die even without wisdom. So you see what he's doing here is he's putting doubt in old Eliphaz. Why in the world? What makes you think that God think, cares anything at all about you, you dummy, you? And then, he even has the audacity, the audacity, to try to put doubt in God, his creator. Now, do you remember, of course, when Jesus was in the tempted 40 days in the wilderness? Satan says, well, if you, if you are the Son of God, if you really are the Son of God. You understand what he was doing? He was trying to put doubt in Jesus. His <coughs> now that takes audacity, folks. Yeah. But if you turn right over, since we're right there to Job chapter 1, and we read verses 6 through 12. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Now this was not in the third heaven. Because Satan would not be allowed in the third heaven. He would, what? He would pollute it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence uh, comest thou? Like he did not. <coughs> then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Yeah, like a roaring lion, seeing who he could destroy. And the Lord said unto Satan, Has thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him, in the earth, a perfect 
and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. In other words, he's saying Job is, is blameless. Blameless. Have you considered him? You see, God knew why Satan was there all along. Now remember, this whole scenario is falling out in front of the angels of heaven. Okay? Uh, we're talking about dignitaries here. That's what that word in Hebrews, or in the book of Jude, uh, Jude means when it says dignitaries. He's talking about angels. Hmm. And so this is, all the angels are watching. This is a challenge. Satan is challenging God. And then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? You see, now what's he trying to do? He's trying to put doubt in God's mind. That's our thing to do, because God not only knows the future, he is the future. Right? I mean, he already knows what's going to happen. And he already knew what Satan was going to say. But, he, but he, he took his challenge. Has not thou made a hedge about him, and about his house, and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. Do you understand what he's saying? He's saying, you don't know. You see, you see, God, you don't really know Job. You don't really know him. Wrong. Amen. God not only, not only knew Job, he knew Satan, right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. And then he says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath in thy power, only upon him put not forth thine hand, so Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Now remember, Satan, Satan wants that office of God. He wants to, he wants to get his position. And uh, I'll tell you what, that's one election. I know how I would vote. Right? So here he actually tries to put doubt in the mind of God. Now that takes audacity. I want you to go over now. We're going to shift gears a little bit here. And as I said, God has given us a divine order. Uh, we see a divine order in the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. They're all equal <coughs> in deity. Why? Because they're the one essence. We see that in the Gospel of John chapter 1. They're one essence. They're all equal. But uh, there is a divine order. Uh, and we see that the Son and the Holy Ghost is subordinate to the Father, even though they're all of one essence. In other words, all through, from Genesis to Revelation, God the Father gives the marching orders, God the Son carries them out, and the Holy Ghost provides the power all through there. So he gives us a divine order, and he does the very same thing with the family. But you see, just like Satan didn't like the way that God had God's laws, he didn't want to be obedient to it. Today, the vast majority of people say, well, that's, that's really not the Bible I want. You see, that's, I don't want a Bible like that. I, I want one that, that uh, tells me uh, what I want to believe. Now, most people won't come right out and say it that way, but, but their actions exactly. speak a lot louder. Their actions do. And if we, if we turn over into 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we read verses 1 through 9. Be you followers, 1 Corinthians 11, of me, even as I also am of Christ. So he's making a point right from out of the shoot. Follow me like I follow Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I deliver them to you. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of every woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. For every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, and dishonoreth his head. Well, you see, you give that natural order there. Uh, God the Father is the head of God the Son. And we see uh, that man is the head of the woman, the husband is the head of the wife, the parents are the head of the children. For every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. But every woman that prayeth, or prophesies with her head uncovered, dishonoreth her head, that is even 
all one than if she were she. Now, uh, here, you say, well, wait a minute, why don't we, why don't our women in here uh, cover their heads? Well, uh, the answer is if we, uh, uh, we keep breathing here, we'll see that uh, it tells you in verses 12 through 14. For if a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much he is the image of, and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. That's probably one of the most asked questions out there today. And the answer to that is she is under the power and the authority of God and her husband and the angels. See, there's, there's things taking place all around us, invisible uh, things. Uh, and all around us, there's angelic activity. A lot of people don't see it. We can't see it. But there's a spiritual battle taking place all around us on a continuous basis. And the angels, in every church where you have a Bible-believing church like this, there will be angels in and so they're watching this, and the whole idea is the power. In other words, uh, for the woman to have a covering on her head, is she is saying that she is under the power and authority of God and her husband. And that's what he's talking about. Amen. In other words, uh, you know, angels uh, interact on our behalf today. They intercede on our behalf. And uh, they can intercede and help you out, or they can intercede and chastise you too. Right. It comes both ways. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man and the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. Judge yourself as it is commonly that a woman pray unto God and cover. Uh, now, here are the next verses tell you that. See, a lot of churches, all the women cover their heads, okay? And the word for a woman's hair is komea. It means long hair. Women are to have long hair. Men are to have short hair. Amen. How many of you knew that? <laughs> There's a lot of guys running around that don't know that. Okay? Uh, he goes on to say, Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? You see, the word Kamea, woman's hair, means she was giving that as a covering. That is her covering. And women are not to, to shave their heads. To have these real short, like you see these women today, uh, running around, you know, with, the, with, with, with butch haircuts. Uh, that is a total dishonor. In fact, in those days, at the Temple of Diana, and that temple went under several names uh, the young women there at Corth spent three years in service as prostitutes at that temple. And the way you would recognize them right away is that they would have their heads shaved. Or very, very short hair. Okay. And um, what he was talking about here, too, uh, there, was, there was quite a, a situation. Because when these young women would get, uh, get saved, these women who had their heads shaved, these prostitutes, and they would come into the church. Well, you know, in, in those days, the women sat on one side and the men on the other. And the women, I remember the first converts, the first converts in the church were uh, all Jewish. And those women, when they would see these, uh, these former prostitutes come into the church, would make sure they stayed very far away from their husbands. And so this was causing quite a, quite a conflict in the church. Uh, we're coming to the end here, so I'm going to close out on the radio and then keep going. Uh, you've been listening to us today on the Liberty Works Radio Network, 104.3 FM in Eagle in Tampa and Ocala. I'm Pastor Ernie Sanders, and this is the voice of the Christian resistance. And until next week, we want to say good morning, God bless, and remember, always, always... <coughs> Keep fighting the fight. Okay, well, I want to pick it back up where I left off here. So he goes on, and that was one of the reasons. 
The other reason there, too, was the power. Uh, if a woman uh, had uh, uh, a covering over her, then that meant that she had a husband or a father or some male to protect her honor in those days. Remember, you had the Roman soldiers. Uh, a slave, a male slave, would have his head uh, covered, meaning he was the property of somebody. Okay, A free man would always have his head uncovered, and that was amongst the pagans there too. So what Paul is telling you here uh, is that for a woman to have short hair, in other words, like Jimmy over there, you see, if you women look like Jimmy, shame on you. <laughs> but, a, but a man uh, was to have uh, long hair. No, got it backwards, right? A man was to have short hair, and women were to have, and he says, even nature tells you that. So, go over to, to 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 14. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, we read in verses 33 to 35. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Now, he's not talking about women talking, he's talking about them preaching in the church. It's about having any kind of authority uh, over the men or taking a position of leadership uh, in the church. And remember, in Corinth, he was dealing with, with uh, a lot of uh, specific problems. And uh, as we go back, remember, Satan uh, sat in the throne room of God. And uh, before we were even created, Satan knew what our weaknesses would be. And, and we see it all through Scripture. Okay, one, men have always been had the major problem with pride. That's, that was man's biggest downfall, pride. Uh, we, we, boy, do we see that in government today. Boy, do we see that also, um, especially in the White House. And that. I mean, you can have, you know, men and women both, you can have that problem, but Mostly, Satan attacks the, the, the men in the area of pride, the women in the, the area of discernment. And that's why God gave women as, as leaders over the people as a punishment for disobedience, Isaiah chapter 3. And you say, well, uh, why is it then, uh, then we'll vote for some women today? Well, uh, this country needs to be punished, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Sometimes because of the society we're living in, when men do not take their place that they're supposed to, we saw that, and stand up and be men, and they allow themselves to be beguiled, and that's what happened. Remember? Do you have a real problem with that today? Adam didn't stand up to his wife. Abraham didn't stand up to his wife. And because they didn't, all the rest of us, you know, we paid a price, didn't we? And we're still paying a price. Turn over to uh, Ephesians chapter 5. And in Ephesians chapter 5, starting with verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as in 12, unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, let your wives, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That he might, may, might, that he mighty, might sanctify and cleanse it with a washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not have his spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. <coughs> so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherished it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of the body. Now remember when he says that, he's not talking about any individual man, because he's speaking to the church here. 
there are people out there in the world who hate their bodies. They hate their bodies. They go around putting all kinds of metal things in their faces. And I saw a fellow on the news. He had this, he had this earring, and his ear was square. It was a, a pathetic, <coughs> pitiful looking thing. And then you're walking around, and I, I couldn't believe it. We were out from one time at, at Planned Predators, and here come this woman in, and uh, apparently she was trying to sell them something. And she opens the truck, wearing a very short skirt, and she's bending over the truck, and then we thought she was wearing pantyhose, but it wasn't. It was tattoos. Her entire legs were tattoos. Okay? And uh, we thought it was pantyhose until we got a closer look at some of the tattoos on there. Uh, but her entire were tattoos. And you see them today. We, we walk around. It used to be, it was a very rare thing indeed when I was growing up, back in the 50s, to ever see a woman with a tattoo. Today, they're all over the place. And, uh, so he, he goes on to say, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined to his wife, and they sh the two shall be one flesh. That's done, especially when you have children. Okay, uh, your DNA, you come up with a separate DNA, and that's the child. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you, in particular, so love his wife, even in himself, and his wife, see that she reverence her husband. Well, that's something that we need to pay very close attention to. I want you to go over to 2 Timothy and in 2 Timothy, you see, this is uh, this message when I'm going to preach on the radio this week. A lot of a lot of women aren't going to like this message. And now here, when we go 2 Timothy, starting with verse nine, chapter one, verse nine. Uh, I'm sorry, first first Timothy, I got it backwards. First Timothy, chapter two, verse nine. 1 Timothy 2, starting with verse 9. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, apparel with shamefacedness, sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. Right? In other words, let the beauty come from the outside. Now remember, uh, in those days when this was written, women that wore these things uh, were, were prostitutes. That's the way that the prostitutes all dressed up there. And uh, you hardly hear the word shamefacedness today at all. And that means uh, women that, that have uh, some dignity about the, the way they conduct themselves and the way they look. They don't want to look like, uh, like horse. But which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let the woman learn in silence and all subjection. For I suffer not a woman to teach nor serve authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, and then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, uh, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Well, that goes back to the idea where, again, Satan only comes after men in pride and, and women in discernment. Uh, Satan, Adam had the authority to take the head off. He had, in that garden, he had the authority. He could have taken the devil's head off. Okay? The devil knew that. He knew he had the authority. God had placed him in that power. And so he went around him. You know, Satan, he, he, he looks and he pries and he, he uh, sees where, uh, where your weakness is. He'll, if you have one, he'll find it. And, and so that's why he went after Eve. He goes on. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in child uh, bearing if they continue in faith and charity now, and holiness and sobriety. Well, what does he mean? Well, uh, how do we find salvation? Salvation was born. We call it the, the birth of the Christ child. Uh, the Lord Jesus came in here being born of a woman. He was manifested in the flesh. And by the same way, uh, for a woman, women were to do what? Their best ministry that a woman could have is to be uh, obedient to her husband, to be a good wife to her husband, and to 
raise the children in the admonition of the Lord. To raise the children in the admonition of the Lord. Amen. So, uh, that's what he's talking about. And then, in conclusion, turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Remember we started out talking about how, you know, if you don't like what's in the Bible, just write your own. And people are doing that. They're doing that out there today. Uh, they're just writing their own Bibles. And uh, so, here if we go to Ecclesiastes chapter 12, starting in verse 9, we read this. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the prophet knowledge. Yea, he gave good heed and sought out and listened, said in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words, and that which was written was upright, even words of truth. The words of the wise are as goads, and his nails fastened by the masters and the assemblies which are given from one shepherd. And further, by these, my son, be admonished of making many books. There is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. Here we go. This is the conclusion, folks. It all comes down. Everything I said today comes down to these two verses right here. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment, and every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Bottom line, we've got a new book to sell all of us. Right? And listen, whenever you find yourself in disagreement with the Word of God, you're wrong. You're wrong. Amen? No one's ever even won an argument with God, much less a battle. So, God always rewards obedience. And He'll punish disobedience. And that's the end of this message. What do you have for me, Jim? 404 in the white. 
We all know that before you take the Lord's table, one, you need to be saved, two, baptized by immersion, and three, and again, remember, the most important, not to have any unconfessed sin. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that.